against the Scottish Assembly next week with a five-day campaign leading up to Friday's convention meeting. On Monday, they will fire the first salvo with a booklet entitled Scottish Assembly, We're Better Off Without It. The Tories claim that the Constitutional Convention package will reduce Scottish MPs' role at Westminster. They say we would have fewer MPs and there would be little justification for the presence of a Scottish Secretary of State in the Cabinet. It would undermine Scotland's influence in Europe as we would have no direct say in EC matters. It would cause more public spending without a clear mechanism for raising the finance. It would end up a greater Strathclyde region if elected under a first-past-the-post system. And the Assembly would be a recipe for uncertainty, for conflict and for cost. For many months now, convention leaders have sought to debate these views with the Conservatives. Until now, the Tories have been content to rubbish what they call the self-appointed convention. Well, in advance of next week's campaign, the opening skirmish is here on left, right and centre. With me are Michael Forsyth MP, the Chairman of the Scottish Conservative Party, and Karen Kenyon-Wright, the Chairman of the Executive Committee of the Scottish Convention. Michael Forsyth, first of all, the Convention is going to come up with a scheme, it claims, which it then will put to the Scottish people before the next election, a scheme for an Assembly. Will you aid them in putting this scheme to the people? Well, I think what we'd like to hear from them is the answer to the fundamental questions which have remained unanswered for more than 10 years now. In Scotland, we spend something like £500 more per head on health and housing and so on. If a Scottish Assembly is to raise the money for that, and it's, that's equivalent to an extra 20 pence on the basic rate of income tax, uh, how are the Scots going to pay for it? What about the position of Scottish MPs who are going to be sent down to a Westminster Parliament and allowed to vote on health care in Doncaster, but not in Dundee? Uh, there are these fundamental questions which make an assembly in Scotland deeply against the interests of Scotland and totally unworkable. Karen Wright, an extra 20 pence on income tax, representation at Westminster which might be unfair to English MPs? These are all questions that the Convention is busy looking at and that we're looking at with expert help and we can see there are several alternative ways of dealing with this kind of question of how Scot the Scottish tax revenue would be raised block grant or assigned revenue systems or there are a whole lot but of it's still to be paid but for by Scottish taxpayers. But instead of having, uh, instead of being part of the debate, I mean I'm very glad that the Conservative Party now has sort of come out of the woodwork and, and is, is prepared to be part of the discussion, but where has it been all this time? No, no, we're and against the, time the Assembly, has come. you have to explain how it's no, going to work. The Convention's basis is not in the first instance an Assembly. The Convention's basis is the claim of right. And the claim of right is the recognition of the principle of the sovereign right of the Scottish people to make their own minds up. But how Anybody does that, that translate accept... into reality? That is a fine phrase. Yes, yeah, a fine phrase, but the point is that therefore, on that basis, we have built a Scottish consensus. The Conservative Party has not been willing to be part of that consensus or even to be part of the debate. Is it too much to ask in this programme that instead of sniping from the sidelines or producing a pamphlet about it, that the Conservative Party might come back, at least as an observer, into the discussions in the Convention well, to be part of the shaping of this. They can do so without any preconditions. We're, we're Why not, don't you put an observer well, into the Convention? Because we're not going to join a body which starts from this, the, the standpoint that the status quo is not an option and which argues that the Union has been damaging to Scottish culture. We are a Unionist party and we believe that Scotland has done well in the Union and indeed the public expenditure levels for our caring services are very much higher in Scotland as a result of the Union. What I'm concerned about, as a responsible politician, is that we have people like Canyon, uh, C Canon Kenyon Wright going around peddling the idea of an assembly without actually addressing the practical issues which would be deeply, deeply damaging to Scotland. We have our top business leaders almost unanimous in their opposition to a, a Scottish assembly. This is just not true. It, it, it's just not true. People like Viscount Weir, First, people like the people who responded to the Business Insider survey, our top companies, half of them saying that they would move their operations out of Scotland, half of them saying that they would reconsider their investment decisions, the business community saying that this is deeply unsettling to Scotland's interests. What about that, that very point, that it is deeply unsettling to Scotland's interests? A hundred companies interest. were asked the question, 36 responded. 25% of Scottish industry is in the convention, the small business sector, and the phrase they used was, we need Scottish solutions to Scottish problems at the moment when the southeast of England gets constipation, we get the medicine, though we have diarrhoea. That's exactly how they put it. Uh, it is simply not true to say that business would suffer. I agree. Well, there is, I agree. Survey, then, I, agree I agree. There is scepticism among business, as there has been in many other parts of Europe before autonomy actually came it's, in. It's but the experience 
of all of Europe. Ours is the only country which insists on this highly centralized government and which insists that it would somehow be economically damaging. It's not a highly, it is not a highly centralized government. We have administrative <laughs> devolution through the Scottish office. We have a substantial block grant which is provided. It's a system which has served Scotland well. Those in the Constitutional Convention are those who are arguing for change. They would lose as our Secretary of State in the Cabinet. They'd reduce the number of Labour MPs at Westminster. The, uh, uh, and, and indeed Scottish MPs at Westminster, uh, it would mean that a Labour government was not able to form a majority in, in cases have. like in 1974 and 1964 to get its domestic policy through, that it would uh, destroy our uh, constitutional system and it would be deeply, deeply damaging to Scotland's interests. And a, a con has been perpetrated here. Uh, we have administrative... Would it destroy the constitutional no, system? No, of course not. Uh, I'm, a, I'm as much a unionist as Michael Forsyth. I, den I deny him the, the, the uh, monopoly of the word unionist. Most people in the convention are unionists. But when he says... But does it not say when, in your claim says of there right... Is, when forgive you say me, there is you say you're a unionist. Does it not say in the claim of right, paragraph 2.2, that the union has been damaging to Scotland's As cultural interests? The claim of right does not consist of the whole of that initial document. The claim of right consists in a single sentence, the sovereign right of the Scottish people. But the point is administrative devolution, block grants, but without any control democratically by the Scottish people over these, except through their representation in Westminster, which is, of course, as we can see, totally unrepresentative. Well, that's but not we true. But we come back to more... the point as well about uh, a Secretary of State in the Cabinet. The, where will the Scottish voice be in foreign affairs, on defence, on those kind of matters? Clearly... The... Or Europe. On Europe, on Europe, of course, the, it's very, very clear that many parts of Europe, many of the other uh, nation, nation groupings, national groupings within nation states in Western Europe are looking to Scotland to support their case for a changing Europe. Europe's changing. It's not the Europe it was. Yes, it's but while you're rapidly, waiting for it to and it's change, changing Scotland's into, interests no, will be lost. No, it's changing into a Europe of nationalities. Who can seriously say that Scotland's interests are well represented in Europe at the moment by a government so totally unrepresentative of Scottish opinion? That's just not true. There is built into the plans which are already made for the Assembly a, a Minister for Europe within the Scottish Government who would work with the Westminster Government in presenting Scottish affairs, yes. but would also have direct Scottish representation in Europe, yeah, which well, is very important. Here, here we science. get to the nitty-gritty. In practice, it will be the Westminster Parliament which will be our uh, voice in Europe. And we will be sending Scottish members of Parliament down there, unable to vote on English domestic issues, limited to defence and foreign affairs. They'll have less to do. At the moment, as part of the uh, deal which we have, we have more MPs than our population justifies. We would lose these, we would lose representation, we would lose influence, and all for what? To have a body run by a kind of greater Strathclyde. Another thing which they aren't even clear about, and which is the reason for the delay, is how this body is going to be elected. The Labour Party are, are divided on proportional representation, and yet the whole Constitutional Convention is brought together by the, with the Liberal Party and the Labour Party on the basis that they will have PR. On that Great point, time. gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, as Michael Forsyth said, Labour is having problems with the electoral system it wants for a Scottish Parliament. And today, the Liberal Democrats kept up the pressure for change. Their Scottish leader, Malcolm Bruce, said the Convention should be openly debating PR now, giving a lead to the Labour movement rather than the other way round. Well, while Labour still supports first-past-the-post elections for Westminster, PR for a Scottish Parliament is gaining ground within the Scottish Labour movement. The Scottish TUC will finalise the policy on electoral reform next month, ready for discussion at the conference in Glasgow in April. Already, New P. Nalgo and the Miners' Union supports PR, while the GMB is lukewarm. The Transport Union will decide next Friday. But some prominent Labour politicians are worried that the party will adopt PR without considering the implications. I think that they would be... Um they would have a very heavy weight of responsibility to justify to the Scottish and the British people thereafter. I think they would be on a course that they would come to regret in, in the years to come. Why? Uh, because of the damage of uh, creating a situation where instability would be the order of the day, where the, uh, the course of government would be determined in smoke-filled rooms rather than the open debating chamber. Well, Labour won't make a final decision until its conference in March. But so far, all eight motions received on electoral reform support some form of PR. Earlier, I spoke to George Galloway MP, a member of the Labour campaign for electoral reform, and George Fawkes MP, who warns that PR can result in the dictatorship of a small minority. 
I asked George Fox why, when the great and the good and some trade unions were partial to PR, he was digging in his heels. When you're proposing change, and a pretty radical and substantial change like this, you need to show that the advantage, the one advantage, outweigh all the disadvantages. And I think the disadvantages are that the link between the Member of Parliament and his constituency is likely to be severed, and that means a, a person raising an issue doesn't know that they've got someone they can go to who has got a duty to pursue that issue. I think it gives more power to the central party bureaucracies in choosing lists and deciding who the member should be, and that changes the whole nature of accountability. And thirdly, I think it can put power into the hands of small, very small minority parties, as we saw in Israel or in Germany. And I think for all those reasons, the, advantages, the advantage doesn't outweigh the disadvantages. And I don't think the arguments for change have, have made the case. George Galloway, on the point of accountability, that politicians would actually be less accountable to their electorate. Oh, it's a terribly old-fashioned view. In fact, we're talking about a system of proportional representation, at least people like me are, the additional member system, which preserves the member constituency link and allows a topping up of the parliament. Half of the parliament will be elected according to a list system, so you've got proportionality and the member constituency link. And that's important. It's important that someone knows who their MP is, but it's equally important that someone's not voting and their vote means nothing because of a first-past-the-post system, which is fundamentally unfair. So you're prepared to reduce, as it would be, Labour's dominance in Scotland through PR, because inevitably that would happen? Well, I don't know that it would inevitably happen, because if we had PR, some people in the north and south of Scotland who don't vote Labour at the minute because there's no point would do so, because their vote would then count. But... Labour shouldn't have overwhelming dominance unless it gets overwhelmingly the majority of votes. But George Galloway is talking about the system that he's advocating. But if you talk to other people uh, in the Labour Party and, of course, in other parties, they advocate other systems. And there isn't any consensus about a system which should replace our existing system. Uh, some people put forward one and some people put forward the other. And while there's no consensus and while there is one advantage, which I concede, uh, but there are so many disadvantages. I don't think the case is made. It's not a matter of Labour's dominance and Conservative dominance. It's a matter of all the factors, and accountability is one very, very important factor. And in fact, George Galloway, if Labour says yes to PR, in these various assemblies they want to have around Great Britain if and when they return to power, you could in fact have a system of ten different assemblies with ten different methods of PR for each. Now, wouldn't that lead to some kind of stress in the constitutional well, makeup? there is one consensus. And the consensus is that the unfair system we have now has got to go. I'm proposing the AMS system, which is one way of uh, beating that unfairness. And I think other regional assemblies might well choose so. But, but how can you have, as you call it, an unfair system at Westminster and what you would want a fair system at an well, assembly? Well, I mean, I'm actually in favour of proportional representation for every election. And incidentally, so are most parliaments in the world. I mean, all these new oh. democracies in Europe that are overthrowing undemocratic regimes are not turning to the first-past-the-post system, which George is supporting. No, I, I mean, if you look at the countries of the Commonwealth, they're mostly the same system as ours. The American oh. system is very similar. Very so that most of the English-speaking countries have got an exactly similar mm. system. But getting back to the, the, the question in hand, which is the Assembly, and what is, in fact, going to be debated is proportional representation for an Assembly at Labour's conference. Are you prepared to risk the convention for the sake of PR? Because undoubtedly the Democrats are serious about this. Well, I think that we should have a good argument within the Labour Party about the, the system of uh, election that we should have to the Assembly. And I think we should have it on a friendly basis as George and I are having it now. I think it's entirely wrong for the Liberal Democrats to put the pistol at our heads and say, if you don't have PR, you won't have an Assembly. And I'm certainly not going to put the pistol at their head. If the, if the there won't be a question of you no, putting a pistol at their no. head, because if you keep the first-past-the-post well, system, they will but pull if, out. If the feeling in the Labour Party is overwhelmingly in favour of changing to proportional representation, I would accept that. Uh, and I think if the, uh, the arguments are made in favour of it, I could even be brought round. But at the present moment, I don't think the arguments have been made. I think the present system has m more ad uh, ad advantages, and I'm prepared to continue arguing that. Not in a rancorous way, and not with any ultimata, uh, as the Liberal Democrats have made. Do you feel that if the Liberal Democrats don't get the way George Galloway, we can wave goodbye to the Convention? Yeah, and we've had a consensus around the Convention and the need for more self-government for Scotland, and it would be entirely wrong for Labour, on the rock of Labour's obduracy in defence of an ancient and indefensible dem undemocratic system, what for the, the Convention view, though, to be wrecked. What about George's view that the minority would gain an 
a disproportionate amount of power. Well, he, yeah. he mentions Germany, I, yes. incredibly, as no. one of the reasons why we shouldn't have PR. Germany is the most successful society in Europe. All these new democracies in Europe are looking to Germany. Germany has a very fine system of government, and we could do very well to emulate no. it. No, I, so, but, finally, George Fouts, will you be arguing against PR at the conference? Well, if I get the opportunity, if I get called to the rostrum, uh, I, I will certainly do so. I'll certainly argue the case. If I'm defeated, I'll accept that defeat gracefully. But I think the case must be argued. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, there are also other signs of increasing tension within the Labour Party over the Constitutional Convention. Activists claim that the Scottish leadership is trying to water down home rule demands to placate party headquarters in London. But the leadership insists that Labour is intent on settling a Scottish strategy consistent with its long-standing UK objectives. The dilemma is summed up in an internal policy document which reflects Labour's response to the consultation exercise linked to the Convention. Left, Right and Centre has obtained a copy of the document and our political correspondent Brian Taylor now reports on the background to Labour's unease. Labour's strategy in Scotland, particularly given the persistent threat of nationalism, has long been to tread warily upon Scottish sensitivity. At the last Scottish conference, Neil Kinnock set out to lay the ghost of devolutionary doubts past and deliver comprehensive support for the Convention with its doctrine of Scottish self-determination. But of course, his main objective is more Labour MPs at Westminster, not entirely new MPs in Edinburgh. The party's Scottish secretary, Murray Elder, reflects this twin-track approach in the private paper he has drafted for tomorrow's meeting of the Scottish Executive. The Elder paper stresses the poor response to consultation and urges the party to be wary of reaching firm conclusions. He wants the party to defer verdicts on issues like Scottish links with Europe, enshrining the Parliament's rights and full-scale industrial powers. But real controversy centres on the Parliament's powers. Elder concedes their support for shifting all control to Scotland with responsibility for issues like defence returned to Westminster by agreement. Elder warns this mirror image of devolution could put some strain on the relationship between Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom and advises Labour to stick with powers granted by Westminster. On funding a Scottish Parliament, he says the old-style solution of a block grant has little or no support. He warns that full-scale Scottish control of taxation could create a conflict between the wish to maximise financial independence and the desire to keep central economic management at the UK level. But with North Sea oil money at the heart of the debate, that stated desire for central UK control has angered Labour home rule activists. They say that a Scottish Parliament would have little real autonomy unless it controlled the tax take from the North Sea, with an agreed proportion diverted to Westminster. They accuse the leadership of ignoring Scottish Labour opinion. At the last general election, the party in Scotland delivered 50 Labour MPs. If we're going to have a Labour government at the next general election, the party in Scotland is going to deliver 56, 57 Labour MPs. The way in which we do that is to be seen as a Scottish party controlling our affairs in Scotland. One of the things which all opinion poll evidence shows has cost the Conservative Party votes in Scotland is that they are perceived to be an English party and they have lost votes as a result. The Labour Party would also lose votes if it went down that road and clearly we've got to put a marker that we control Scottish matters in Scotland and we have that degree of independence of action. That desire for maximum devolution encompasses the party chairman Mark Lazarovich. He counters Elder in offering support to the mirror image approach with its starting point of full power to Scotland and he warns that there could be lasting political problems otherwise. My message would be that it is in Labour's interest in Scotland for us to take the initiative, for us to come up with proposals which will stand the test of time. There's no point in deciding upon partial measures which will have to be reassessed a few years from, from now. Meanwhile, Labour's principal partners in the convention, the Liberal Democrats, are watching with concern. They acknowledge the lasting good intentions of Labour's Scottish leadership in the talks, but concern persists over the source of real power and influence. The major decisions uh, ultimately will be made in London because that's the way the Labour Party's constitution is. And if Roy Hattersley and Neil Kinnock uh, decide that uh, you know, the home rule proposals brought up by the Labour Party in Scotland are going too far, then they will be able to pull the rug from under the Labour Party's feet here. We hope, because the Labour Party have really uh, gone a long way down the road towards meeting our proposals on, on home rule, that they will be able to continue to do that. 
but I think we're worried at the end of the day that the heavy hand of Walworth Road may just be too much for the Labour Party in Scotland. Elder insists such fears are groundless, and he warns home rule activists in his own party that they risk alienating not London, but Scotland. Quite legitimately, of course, the National Party has a profound interest in what's happening in, in Scotland. That is right. I think I would be upset if they didn't. And, of course, we're keeping them closely informed about what's going on and the discussions we're having within the Convention. Um, but uh, there's no question of a fine balancing act at the moment. I mean, we're, we're, we're looking at Scottish policy in, in Scottish political terms. Will London impose a veto upon a Scottish scheme if, if it's too extreme from their viewpoint? I, I don't imagine anything like that uh, coming about. The Scottish Party is in close contact with the National Party. I can't imagine these circumstances coming about at all. And I think it's, it's simply wrong to, 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 to judge that. As I say, it is, a, it is possible to imagine a scheme uh, that the National Party would object to, but I think it would be quite easy to imagine that scheme would be objected by the Scottish Party as well. Because the first thing to do is to try and establish what Scottish policy is. And I suspect Scottish policy is not to go down some of the more extreme routes towards something that might be described as separatism or nationalism, um, which would undoubtedly cause problems in national terms, but they would cause problems in Scottish terms as well. So the party is adamant that Labour's true stance has yet to emerge. But for Labour's leadership, the fact remains that formal consultation so far has generated support for outright Scottish autonomy, a giant leap beyond the party's current standpoint. At the Scottish conference in March and in further convention talks, the leadership may still face a difficult choice between placating emergent Scottish activism and maintaining the party's UK strategy.